Part One of Raiders of the Universes by Donald A. Wondre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Phil Chenever. It was in the thirty-fourth century that the Dark Star began its famous conquest, unparalleled in stellar annals. Phobar, the astronomer, discovered it. He was sweeping the heavens with one of the newly invented multi-powered Sussendorf comet hunters, when something caught his eye, a new star of great brilliance in the foreground of the constellation Hercules. For the rest of the night he cast aside all his plans and concentrated on the one star. He witnessed an unprecedented event. Mercia's nullifier had just been invented, a curious and intricate device, based on four-dimensional geometry that made it possible to see occurrences in the universe which had hitherto required the hundreds of years needed for light to cross the intervening space before they were visible on Earth. By a hasty calculation, with the aid of this invention, Phobar found that the new star was about three thousand light-years distant, and that it was hurtling backward into space at the rate of twelve hundred miles per second. The remarkable feature of his discovery was this appearance of a fourth-magnitude star where none had been known to exist. Perhaps it had come into existence this very night. On the succeeding night he was given a greater surprise. In line with the first star, but several hundred light-years nearer, was a second new star of even more brightness, and it, too, was hurtling backward into space at approximately twelve hundred miles per second. Phobar was astonished. Two new stars discovered within twenty-four hours in the same part of the heavens, both of the fourth magnitude. But his surprise was as nothing when on the succeeding night, even while he watched, a third new star appeared in line with these, but much closer. At midnight he first noticed a pinpoint of faint light. By one o'clock the star was of eighth magnitude. At two it was a brilliant sun of the second magnitude, blazing away from Earth like the others at a rate of twelve hundred miles per second. And on the next evening, and the next, and the next, other new stars appeared until there were seven in all, every one on a line in the same constellation Hercules, every one with the same radiance and the same proper motion, though of varying size. Phobar had broadcast his discovery to incredulous astronomers, but as star after star appeared nightly, all the telescopes on Earth were turned toward one of the most spectacular cataclysms that history recorded. Far out in the depths of space, with unheard of regularity and unheard of precision, new worlds were flaming up overnight in a line that began at Hercules and extended toward the solar system. Phobar's announcement was immediately flashed to Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, the other members of the Five World Federation. Saturn reported no evidence of the phenomena because of the interfering rings and the lack of Mercia's nullifier. But Jupiter, with a similar device, witnessed the phenomena and announced furthermore that many stars in the neighborhood of the new Novae had begun to deviate in singular and abrupt fashion from their normal positions. There was not as yet much popular interest in the phenomena. Without Mercier's nullifier, the stars were not visible to ordinary eyes, since the light rays would take years to reach the Earth. But every astronomer who had access to Mercier's nullifier hastened to focus his telescope on the region where extraordinary events were taking place out in the unfathomable gulf of night. Some terrific force was at work, creating worlds and disturbing the positions of stars 
within a radius already known to extend billions and trillions of miles from the path of the seven new stars but of the nature of that force astronomers could only guess phobar took up his duties early on the eighth night the last star had appeared about five hundred light years distant if an eighth new star was found it should be not more than a few light years away but nothing happened all night phobar kept his telescope pointed at the probable spot but search as he might the heavens showed nothing new in the morning he sought eagerly for news of any discovery made by fellow watchers but they too had found nothing unusual could it be that the mystery would now fade away a new riddle of the skies the next evening he took up his position once more training his telescope on the seven bright stars and then on the region where an eighth if there were one should appear for hours he searched the abyss in vain he could find none apparently the phenomena were ended at midnight he took a last glance before entering on some tedious calculations it was there in the center of the telescope a faint hazy object steadily grew in brightness all his problems were forgotten as phobar watched the eighth star increase hourly closer than any other closer even than alpha centauri the new sun appeared scarcely three light years away across the void surrounding the solar system and all the while he watched he witnessed a thing no man had ever seen before the birth of a world by one o'clock the new star was of fifth magnitude by two it was of the first as the faint flush of dawn began to come toward the close of that frosty moonless november night the new star was a great white hot object more brilliant than any other star in the heavens phobar knew that when its light finally reached earth so that ordinary eyes could see it it would be the most beautiful object in the night sky what was the reason for these unparalleled births of worlds and the terrifying mathematical precision that characterized them whatever the cosmic force behind it was progressing toward the solar system perhaps it would even disturb the balance of the planets the possible chance of such an event had already called the attention of some astronomers but the whole phenomenon was too inexplicable to permit more than speculation the next evening was cloudy jupiter reported nothing new except that neptune had deviated from its course and tended to pursue an erratic and puzzling new orbit phobar pondered long over this last news item and turned his attention to the outermost planet on the succeeding night to his surprise he had great difficulty in locating it the ephemeris was of absolutely no use when he did locate neptune after a brief search he discovered it more than eighty million miles from its scheduled place this was at one forty at two ten he was thunderstruck by a special announcement sent from the central bureau to every observatory and astronomer of note throughout the world proclaiming the discovery of an ultra plutonian planet phobar was incredulous for centuries it had been proved that no planet beyond pluto could possibly exist with feverish haste phobar ran to the huge telescope and rapidly focused it where the new planet should be five hundred million miles beyond neptune was a flaming path like the beam of a giant searchlight that extended exactly to the eighth solar planet phobar gasped he could hardly credit the testimony of his eyes he looked more closely the great stream of flame still crossed his line of vision but this time he saw something else at the precise farther end of the flame path a round disk dark 
beyond a doubt a new planet of vast size now formed an addition to the solar group but that planet was almost impervious to the illuminating rays of the sun and was barely discernible neptune itself shone brighter than it ever had and was falling away from the sun at a rate of twelve hundred miles per second all night phobar watched the double mystery by three o'clock he was convinced as far as lightning calculations showed that the invader was hurtling toward the sun at a speed of more than ten million miles an hour at three fifteen he thought that vanishing neptune seemed brighter even than the band of fire running to the invader at four his belief was certainty with amazement and awe phobar sat through the long cold night watching a spectacular and terrible catastrophe in the sky as dawn began to break and the stars grew paler phobar turned away from his telescope his brain a whirl his heart filled with a great fear he had witnessed the devastation of a world the ruin of a member of his own planetary system by an invader from outer space as dawn cut short his observations he knew at last the cause of neptune's brightness knew that it was now a white-hot flaming sun that sped with increased rapidity away from the solar system somehow the terrible swath of fire that flowed from the dark star to neptune had wrenched it out of its orbit and made it a molden inferno at dawn came another bulletin from the central bureau neptune had a surface temperature of three thousand degrees centigrade was defying all laws of celestial mechanics and within three days would have left the solar system forever the results of such a disaster were unpredictable the entire solar system was likely to break up already uranus and jupiter had deviated from their orbits unless something speedily occurred to check the onrush of the dark star it was prophesied that the laws governing the planetary system would run to a new balance and that in the ensuing chaos the whole group would spread apart and fall toward the gulfs beyond the great surrounding void what was the nature of the great path of fire what force did it represent and was the dark star controlled by intelligence or was it a blind wanderer from space that had come by accident the flame path alone implied that the dark star was guided by an intelligence that possessed the secret of inconceivable power menace hung in the air now where all eyes could see in a great arc of fire the world was on the brink of eternity and vast forces at whose nature men could only guess were sweeping planets and suns out of its path the following night was again cold and clear high in the heavens where neptune should have been hung a disk of enormously greater size neptune itself was almost invisible hundreds of millions of miles beyond its scheduled position as nearly as phobar could estimate not one hundredth of the sun's rays were reflected from the surface of the dark star a proportion far below those of the other planets phobar had a better view of the flame path and it was with growing awe that he watched that strange swath in the sky during the dead of night it shot out from the dark star like a colossal beam or huge pillar of fire seeking a food of worlds with a shiver of cold fear he saw that there were now three of the bands one toward neptune one toward saturn and one toward the sun the first was fading a milky misty white the second shone almost as bright as the first one previously had and the third toward the sun was a dazzling stream of orange radiance burning with a steady terrible unbelievable intensity across two and a half billions of miles of space 
that gigantic flare was the most brilliant sight in the whole night sky an awful and abysmal prophetic flame that made city streets black with staring people a radiance whose grandeur and terrific implication of cosmic power brought beauty and the fear of doom into the heavens those paths could not be explained by all the physicists and all the astronomers in the five world federation they possessed the properties of light but they were rigid bands like a tube or a solid pillar from which only the faintest of rays escaped and they completely shut off the heavens behind them they had moreover singular properties which could not be described as if a new force were embodied in them hour after hour humanity watched the spectacular progress of the dark star watched those mysterious and threatening paths of light that flowed from the invader when dawn came it brought only a great fear and the oppression of impending disaster in the early morning phobar slept when he awoke he felt refreshed and decided to take a short walk in the familiar and peaceful light of day he never took that walk he opened the door on a kind of dim and reddish twilight not a cloud in the sky but the sun shone feebly with a dull red glow and the skies were dull and somber as if the sun were dying as scientists had predicted it eventually would phobar stared at the dull heavens in a daze at the foreboding atmosphere and the livid sun that burned faintly as through a smoke curtain then the truth flashed on him it was the terrible path of fire from the dark star by what means he could not guess by what appalling control of immense and inconceivable forces he could not even imagine the dark star was sucking light and perhaps more than light from the sun phobar turned and shut the door the world had seen its last dawn if the purpose of the dark star was destruction none of the planets could offer much opposition for no weapon of theirs was effective beyond a few thousand miles range at most and the dark star could span millions if the invader passed on its havoc would be only a trifle smaller for it had already destroyed two members of the solar system and was now striking at its most vital part without the sun life would die but even with the sun the planets must rearrange themselves because of the destruction of balance even he could hardly grasp the vast and abysmal catastrophe that without warning had swept from space how could the dark star have traversed three thousand light years of space in a week's time it was unthinkable so stupendous a control of power so gigantic a manipulation of cosmic forces so annihilating a possession of the greatest secrets of the universe was an unheard-of concentration of energy and knowledge of stellar mechanics but the evidence of his own eyes and the path of the dark star with flaming suns to mark its progress told him in language which could not be refuted that the dark star possessed all that immeasurable titanic knowledge it was the lord of the universe there was nothing which the dark star could not crush or conquer or change the thought of that immense supreme power numbed his mind it opened vistas of a civilization and a progress and an unparalleled mastery of all knowledge which was almost beyond conception already the news had raced across the world on phobar's television screen flashed scenes of nightmare the radio spewed a gibberish of terror in one day panic had swept the earth on the remaining members of the five world federation the same story was repeated rioting mobs drowned out the chant of religious fanatics who hailed judgment day great fires turned the air murky and flame-shot 
Machine guns spat regularly in city streets. Looting, murder, and fear-crazed crimes were universal. Civilization had completely vanished overnight. The tides roared higher than they ever had before. For every thousand people drowned on the American seaboards, a hundred thousand perished in China and India. Dead volcanoes boomed into the worst eruptions known. Half of Japan sank during the most violent earthquake in history. Land rocked, the seas boiled, cyclones howled out of the skies. A billion eyes focused on Mecca. The mad beating of tom-toms rolled across all Africa. Women and children were trampled to death by the crowds that jammed into churches. "'Has man lived in vain?' asked the philosopher. "'The world is doomed. There is no escape,' said the scientist. "'The day of reckoning has come. The wrath of God is upon us,' shouted the street preachers. In a daze, Phobar switched off the bedlam and, walking like a man asleep, strode out. He did not care where, if only to get away. The ground and the sky were like a dying fire. The sun seemed a half-dead cinder. Only the great swath of radiance between the sun and the dark star had any brilliance. Sinister, menacing, now larger even than the sun, the invader from beyond hung in the heavens. As Phobar watched it, the air around him prickled strangely. A sixth sense gave warning. He turned to race back into his house. His legs failed. A fantastic orange light bathed him. Countless needles of pain shot through his whole body. The world darkened. Earth had somehow been blotted out. There was a brief blackness, the nausea of space and of a great fall that compressed eternity into a moment. Then a swimming confusion and outlines which gradually came to rest. Phobar was too utterly amazed to cry out or run. He stood inside the most titanic edifice he could have imagined, a single gigantic structure vaster than all New York City. Far overhead swept a black roof, fading into the horizon. Beneath his feet was the same metal substance. In the midst of this giant work soared the base of a tower that pierced the roof thousands of feet above. Everywhere loomed machines, enormous dynamos, cathode tubes a hundred feet long, masses and mountains of such fantastic apparatus as he had never encountered. The air was bluish, electric. From the black substance came a phosphorescent radiance. The triumphant drone of motors and a terrific crackle of electricity were everywhere. Off to his right, Purple-blue flames the size of sequoia trees flickered around a group of what looked like condensers as huge as Gibraltar. At the base of the central tower, half a mile distant, Phobar could see something that resembled a great switchboard studded with silver controls. Near it was a series of mechanisms at whose purpose he could not even guess. All this his astounded eyes took in at one confused glance. The thing that gave him unreasoning terror was the hundred-foot-high metal monster before him. It defied description. It was unlike any color known on earth, a blinding color sinister with power and evil. Its shape was equally ambiguous. It rippled like quicksilver now compact, now spread out in a thousand limbs. But what appalled Phobar was its definite possession of rational life. More, its very thoughts were transmitted to him as clearly as though written in its own English. Follow me. Phobar's mind did not function, but his legs moved regularly. In the grasp of this mental metal monster, he was a mere automaton. 
Fobar noticed idly that he had to step down from a flat disk a dozen yards across. By some power, some tremendous discovery that he could not understand, he had been transported across millions of miles of space, undoubtedly to the dark star itself. The colossal thing, indescribable, a blinding, nameless color, rippled down the hall and stooped before a disk of silvery black. In the center of the disk was a metal seat with a control board nearby. Be seated. Phobar sat down. The titan flicked the controls, and nothing happened. Phobar sensed that something was radically wrong. He felt the surprise of his gigantic companion. He did not know it then, but the fate of the solar system hung on that incident. Come. Abruptly the giant stooped and Phobar shrank back, but a flowing mass of cold, insensate metal swept around him, lifted him fifty feet in the air. Dizzy, sick, horrified, he was hardly conscious of the whirlwind motion into which the giant suddenly shot. He had a dim impression of machines racing by, of countless other giants, of a sudden opening in the walls of the immense building, and then a rush across the surface of metal land. Even in his vertigo he had enough curiosity to marvel that there was no vegetation, no water, only the dull black metal everywhere. Yet there was air and then a city loomed before them. To Phobar it seemed a city of gods or giants. Fully five miles it soared toward space. Its fantastic angles and arcs and cubes and pyramids mazing in the dimensions of a totally alien geometry. Tier by tier, the stupendous city, hundreds of miles wide, mounted toward a central tower like the one in the building he had left. Phobar never knew how they got there, but his numbed mind was at last forced into clarity by a greater will. He stared about him. His captor had gone. He stood in a huge chamber, circling to a dome far overhead. Before him, on a dais, a full thousand feet in diameter, stood, sat, rested, whatever it might be called, Another monster, far larger than any he had yet seen, like a mountain of pliant thinking living metal. And Phobar knew he stood in the presence of the ruler. The metal cyclops surveyed him as Phobar might have surveyed an ant. Cold, deadly, dispassionate scrutiny came from something that might have been eyes or a seeing intelligence locked in a metal body. There was no sound, but inwardly to Phobar's consciousness, from the peak of the titan far above him came a command. What are you called? Phobar opened his lips, but even before he spoke he knew that the thing had understood his thought. Phobar. I am Gorboreg. Ruler of Exlorbiti, the Lord of the Universes. Lord of the Universes? I and my world came from one of the universes beyond the reach of your telescopes. Phobar somehow felt that the thing was talking to him as he would to a newborn babe. What do you want of me? Tell your Earth that I want the entire supply of your radium ores mined and placed above ground according to the instructions I give by seven of your days hence. A dozen questions sprang to Phobar's lips. He felt again that he was being treated like a child. Why do you want our radium ores? Because they are the rarest of the elements on your scale, or absent on ours, and supply us with some of the tremendous energy we need. Why don't you obtain the ores from other worlds? We do. We are taking them from all worlds where they exist, but we need yours also. 
Raiders of the universe? Looting young worlds of the precious radium ores? Piracy on a cosmic scale. And if Earth refuses your demand? End of part one. Part Two of Raiders of the Universes by Donald Wandrie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And if Earth refuses your demand, for answer, Gorboreg rippled to a wall of the room and pressed a button. The wall dissolved weirdly, mysteriously. A series of vast silver plates was revealed, and a battery of control levers. This will happen to all of your Earth unless the ores are given us. The Titan closed a switch. On the first screen flashed the picture of a huge tower, such as Phobar had seen in the Metal City. Gorboreg adjusted a second control that was something like a range finder. He pressed a third lever, and from the tower leaped a surge of terrific energy like a bolt of lightning a quarter of a mile broad. The giant closed another switch, and on the second plate flashed a picture of New York City. Then, waiting, seconds, minutes drifted by. The atmosphere became tense, nerve-cracking. Phobar's eyes ached with the intensity of his stare. What would happen? Abruptly, it came. A monstrous bolt of energy streaked from the skies, purple-blue death in a pillar a fourth of a mile broad, crashed into the heart of New York City, swept up and down Manhattan, across and back, and suddenly vanished. In fifteen seconds, only a molten hell of fused structures and incinerated millions of human beings remained of the world's first city. Phobar was crushed, appalled. Then utter loathing for this soulless thing poured through him. If only— It is useless. You can do nothing, answered the ruler as though it had grasped his thought. But why, if you could pick me off the earth, do you not draw the radium ores in the same way? Phobar demanded. The orange ray picks up only loose, portable objects. We can, and will, transport the radium ores here by means of the ray after they have been mined and placed on platforms or disks. Why did you select me from all the millions of people on Earth? Solely because you were the first apparent scientist whom our Cosmotel chanced upon. It will be up to you to notify your Earth governments of our demand. But afterwards, Phobar burst out aloud, what then? We will depart. It will mean death to us. The solar system will be wrecked with Neptune gone and Saturn following it. Gorboreg made no answer. To that impassive, cold, inhuman thing, it did not matter if a nation or a whole world perished. Phobar had already seen with what deliberate calm it destroyed a city merely to show him what power the lords of Exlorbity controlled. Besides, what guarantee was there that the invaders would not loot the earth of everything they wanted and then annihilate all the life upon it before they departed? Yet Phobar knew he was helpless knew that the men of Earth would be forced to do whatever was asked of them, and trust that the raiders would fulfill their promise. Two hours remain for your stay here, came the ruler's dictum to interrupt his line of thought. For the first half of that period, you will tell me of your world and answer whatever questions I may ask. During the rest of the interval, I will explain some of the things you wish to learn about us. Again Phobar felt Gorboreg's disdain, knew that the metal giant regarded him as a kind of a childish plaything for an hour or two's amusement, but he had no choice. And so he told Gorboreg of the life on earth, 
how it arose and along what lines it had developed he narrated in brief the extent of man's knowledge his scientific achievements his mastery of weapons and forces and machines his social organization when he had finished he felt as a stone age man might feel in the presence of a brilliant scientist of the thirty-fourth century if any sign of interest had shown on the peak of the metallic lord phobar failed to see it but he sensed an intolerant sneer of ridicule in Gorboreg, as though the ruler considered these statements to be only the most elementary of facts then for three quarters of an hour in a manner of one lecturing an ignorant pupil the giant crowded its thought pictures into phobar's mind so that finally he understood a little of the raiders and of the sudden terror that had flamed from the abyss into the solar system the universe of matter that you know is only one of the countless universes which comprise the cosmos began Gorboreg. in your universe you have a scale of ninety-two elements you have your color spectrum your rays and waves of many kinds you are subject to definite laws controlling matter and energy as you know them but we are of a different universe on a different scale from yours a trillion light years away in space eons distant in time the natural laws which govern us differ from those controlling you in our universe you would be hopelessly lost completely helpless unless you possess the knowledge that your people will not attain even in millions of years but we who are so much older and greater than you have for so long studied the nature of the other universes that we can enter and leave them at will taking what we wish doing as we wish creating or destroying worlds wherever the need arises coming and hurtling away when we choose there is no vegetable life in our universe there is only the scale of elements ranging from 842 to 966 on the extension of your own scale at this high range metals of complex kinds exist there is none of what you call water no vegetable world no animal kingdom instead there are energies forces rays and waves which are food to us and which nourish our life stream just as pigs potatoes and bread are food to you trillions of years ago in your time calculation but only a few dozen centuries ago in ours life arose on the giant world kygipton in our universe it was life our life the life of my people and myself intelligence animating bodies of pliant metal existing almost endlessly on an almost inexhaustible source of energy but all matter wears down on kygipton there was a variety of useful metals others that were valueless there was comparatively little of the first much of the second kygipton itself was a world as large as your entire solar system with a diameter roughly of four billion miles our ancestors knew that kygipton was dying that the store of our most precious element starel was dwindling but already our ancestors had mastered the forces of our universe had made inventions that are beyond your understanding had explored the limits of our universe in space cars that were propelled by the free energies in space and by the attraction repelling influences of stars the metal inhabitants of kygipton employed every invention they knew to accomplish an engineering miracle that makes your bridges and mines seem the puny efforts of a gnat they blasted all the remaining ores of starel from the surface and interior of kygipton and refined them 
Then they created a gigantic vacuum, a dead field in space a hundred million miles away from their world. The dead field was controlled from Kygipton by atomic projectors, energy absorbers, gravitation nullifiers and cosmotels, range regulators, and a host of other inventions. As fast as it was mined and extracted, the Starel metal was vaporized, shot into the dead field by interstellar rays, and solidified there along an invisible framework which we projected. In a decade of our time, we had pillaged Kygipton of every particle of Starel, and then in our skies hung an artificial world a manufactured sphere a giant new planet the world you yourself are now on ex lorbiti we did not create a solid globe we left chambers tunnels passageways store rooms throughout it or piercing it from surface to surface thus even as ex lorbiti was created we provided for everything that we needed or could need experimental laboratories subsurface vaults chambers for the innumerable huge ray dynamos energy storage batteries and other apparatus which we required and when all was ready we transferred by space cars and by atomic individuation all our necessities from Kygipton to the artificial world Exlorbiti. And when everything was prepared, we destroyed the dead field by duplicate control from Exlorbiti, turned our repulsion power on full against the now useless and dying giant world Kygipton, and swung upon our path. But our whole universe is incredibly old. It was mature before even your young suns flamed out of the gaseous nebulae. It was decaying when your molten planets were flung from the central sun. It was dying before the boiling seas had given birth to land upon your sphere. And while we had enough of our own particular electrical food to last us for a million of your years, and enough power to guide Exlorbiti to other universes, we had exhausted all the remaining energy of our entire universe. And when we finally left it to dwindle behind us in the black abyss of space, we left it a dead cinder, devoid of life, vitiated of activity, and utterly lacking in cosmic forces, a universe finally run down. The universes, as you may know, are set off from each other by totally black and empty abysses, expanses so vast that light rays have not yet crossed many of them. How did we accomplish the feat of traversing such a gulf? By the simplest of means, acceleration. Why? Because to remain in our universe meant inevitable death. We gambled on the greatest adventure in all the cosmos. To begin with, we circled our universe to the remotest point opposite where we wanted to leave it. We then turned our attraction powers on part way so that the millions of stars before us drew us ahead. Then we gradually stepped up the power to its full strength, thus ever increasing our speed. At the same time, as stars passed to our rear in our flight, we turned our repulsion rays against them, stepping that power up also. Our initial speed was 24 miles per second. Midway in our universe we had reached the speed of your light, 186,000 miles per second. By the time we left our universe, we were hurtling at a speed which we estimated to be one billion six hundred million miles per second. Yet, even at that tremendous speed, it took us years to cross from our universe to yours. If we had encountered even a planetoid at that enormous rate, 
we would probably have been annihilated in white hot death but we had planned well and there were no superiors to our stellar mechanics our astronomers our scientists when we finally hurtled from the black void into your universe we found what we had only dared hope for a young universe with many planets and cooling worlds rich in radium ores the only element in your scale that can help to replenish our vanishing energy half your universe we have already deprived of its ores your earth has more that we want then we shall continue on our way to loot the rest of the worlds before passing on to another universe we are a planet without a universe we will wander and pillage until we find a universe like the one we came from or until Ixlarbiti itself disintegrates and we perish we could easily wipe out all the dwellers on earth and mine the ores ourselves but that would be a needless waste of our powers for since you cannot defy us and since the desire for life burns as high in you as in us and as it does in all sensate things in all universes your people will save themselves from death and save us from wasting energy by mining the ores for us what happens afterwards we do not care the seven new suns that you saw were dead worlds that we used as buffers to slow down Ixlarbiti. the full strength of our repulsor force directed against any single world necessarily turns it into a liquid or gaseous state depending on various factors your planet neptune was pulled out of the solar system by the attraction of Ixlarbiti's mass the flame paths as you call them are directed streams of energy for different purposes the one to the sun supplies us for instance with heat light and electricity which in turn are stored up for eventual use the orange ray that you felt is one of our achievements it is similar to the double action pumps used in some of your sulfur mines whereby a pipe is enclosed in a larger pipe and hot water forced down through the larger tubing returns sulfur laden through the central pipe the orange ray instantaneously dissolves any portable object up to a certain size propels it back to Ixlarbiti through its center which is the reversed ray and here reforms the object just as you were recreated on the disk that you stood on when you regained consciousness but i have not enough time to explain everything on Ixlarbiti to you nor would you comprehend it all if i did your stay is almost up in that one control panel lies all the power that we have mastered boasted gorboreg with supreme egotism it connects with the individual controls throughout Ixlarbiti what is the purpose of some of the levers asked phobar with a desperate hope in his thoughts a filament of metal whipped to the panel from the lord of Ixlarbiti. this first section duplicates the control panel that you saw in the laboratory where you opened your eyes do not think that you can make use of this information in ten minutes you will be back on your earth to deliver our command between now and that moment you will be so closely watched that you can do nothing and will have no opportunity to try the first lever controls the attraction rays the second the repulsion force the third dial regulates the orange ray by which you will be returned to earth the fourth switch directs the electrical bolt that destroyed new york city next is a device that we have never had occasion to use it releases the krangor wave throughout Ixlarbiti its effect is to make each atom of Ixlarbiti the starel metal and everything on it become compact to do away with the empty spaces that exist in every atom theoretically it would reduce Ixlarbiti to a fraction of its present size diminish its mass while its weight and gravity remained as before the next lever 
controls matter to be transported between here and the first laboratory somewhat like the orange ray it disintegrates the object and reassembles it here so that was what phobar's captor had been trying to do with him back there in the laboratory why was i not brought here by that means burst out phobar because you belong to a different universe answered garboreg without experimentation we cannot tell what natural laws of ours you would not be subject to but this is one of them a gesture of irritation seemed to come from him some laws hold good in all the universes we have thus far investigated the orange ray for instance picked you up as it would have plucked one of us from the surface of kygipton but on xlarbiti which is composed entirely of Stalrel, your atomic nature and physical constitution are so different from ours that they were unaffected by the energy that ordinarily transports objects here thus the metal nightmare went rapidly over the control panel at length phobar's captor or another thing like him re-entered when gorboreg flicked a strange-looking protuberance on the panel you will now be returned to your earth came the thought of gorboreg we shall watch you through our cosmotel to see that you deliver our instructions unless the nations of earth obey us they will be obliterated at the end of seven days a wild impulse to smash that impassive metallic monster passed from phobar as quickly as it came he was helpless sick and despairing he felt the cold baffling colored metal close around him again once more he was borne aloft for the journey to the laboratory from there to be propelled back to earth seven days of grace but phobar knew that less than ten minutes remained to him only here could he possibly accomplish anything once off the surface of Xlarbiti, there was not the remotest chance that all the nations of earth could reach the invaders or even attempt to defy them yet what could he alone do in a week to say nothing of ten minutes he sensed the amused supercilious contempt of his captor that was really the greatest obstacle this ability of theirs to read thought pictures and already he had given them enough word pictures of english so that they could understand in the back of phobar's mind the ghost of a desperate thought suddenly came what was it he had learned years ago in college homer the odyssey plutarch from rusty disused corners of memory crept forth the half-forgotten words he bent all his efforts to the task not daring to think ahead or plan ahead or visualize anything but the greek words he felt the bewilderment of his captor to throw it off the track phobar suddenly let an ancient english nursery rhyme slip into his thoughts the disgust that emanated from his captor was laughable phobar could have shouted aloud but the greek words already the pair had left the mountain-high titan city far behind they rippled across the smooth black surface of exlarbity and bore like rifle bullets down on the swiftly looming laboratory in a few minutes it would be too late forever now the lost greek words burst into phobar's mind and hoping against hope he thought in greek word pictures which his captor could not understand he weighed chances long shots into his brain flashed an idea but they were upon the laboratory a stupendous door dissolved weirdly into shimmering haze they sped through phobar's hand clutched a bulge in his pocket would it work how could it they were beyond the door now and racing across the great expanse of the floor past the central tower past the control panel which he had first seen and as if by magic there leaped into phobar's mind a clear-cut vivid picture 
of violet oceans of energy crackling and streaking from the heavens to crash through the laboratory roof and barely miss striking his captor behind. Even as Phobar created the image of that terrific death, his captor whirled around in a lightning movement, a long arm of metal flicking outward at the same instant to drop Phobar to the ground. Like a flash, Phobar was on his feet, his hand whipped from his pocket, and with all his strength he flung a gleaming object straight toward the fifth lever on the control panel, a dozen yards away. As a clumsy arrow would, his oversized bunch of keys, twisted to their mark, clanked and spread against the fifth control, which was the size regulator. As rapidly as Phobar's captor had spun around, it reversed again, having guessed the trick. A tentacle of pliant metal snaked toward Phobar like a streak of flame. But in those few seconds, a terrific holocaust had taken place. As Phobar's keys spattered against the fifth lever, there came an immediate, growing, strange, high whine, and a sickening collapse of the very surface beneath them. Everywhere, outlines of objects wavered, changed, melted, shrank with a steady and nauseatingly swift motion. The roof of the laboratory, high overhead, plunged downward. The far distant walls swept inward, contracted, and the metal monsters themselves dwindled as though they were vast rubber figures from which the air was hissing. Phobar sprang back as the tentacle whipped after him. Only that jump and the suddenly dwarfing dimensions of the giant saved him. And even in that instant of wild action, Phobar shouted aloud, for this whole world was collapsing, together with everything on it, except he himself who came of a different universe and remained unaffected. It was the long shot he had gambled on, the one chance he had to strike a blow. All over the shrinking laboratory the monsters were rushing toward him. His dwindling captor flung another tentacle toward the control panel to replace the size-regulating lever, but Phobar had anticipated that possibility and had already leaped to the switchboard, sweeping a heavy bar from his place and crashing it down on the lever so that it could not be replaced without being repaired. Almost in the same move, he had bounded away again, the former hundred-foot giant now scarcely more than his own height. But throughout the laboratory, the other metal things had halted in their tasks and were racing onward. Phobar always remembered that battle in the laboratory as a scene from some horrible nightmare. The catastrophe came so rapidly that he could hardly follow the whirlwind events. The half-dozen great leaps he made from the lashing tentacles of his pursuer sufficed to give him a few seconds' respite, and then the weird, howling sound of the tortured world swelled to a piercing wail. His lungs were laboring from the violence of his exertions. Again and again he barely escaped from the curling whips of metal tentacles. And now the monster was hardly a foot high. The huge condensers and tubes and colossal machinery were like those of a pygmy laboratory. And overhead the roof plunged ever downward. But Phobar was cornered at last. He stood in the center of a circle of the foot-high things. His captors suddenly shot forth a dozen rope-like arms toward him as the others closed in. He had not even a weapon, for he had dropped the bar in his first mad bound away from the control panel. He saw himself trapped in his own trick, for in minutes at most the laboratory would be crushing him with fearful force. Blindly, Phobar reverted to a primitive defense in this moment of infinite danger and kicked with all his strength at the squat monster before him. The thing tried to whirl aside, but Phobar's shoe squashed thickly through, and in a disorder of quivering pieces the metal creature fell and subsided. Knowing at last that the invaders were vulnerable and how they could be killed, 
Phobar went leaping and stamping on those nearest him. Underfoot, they disintegrated into little pulpy lumps of inert metal. In a trice, he broke beyond the circle and darted to the control panel. One quick glance showed him that the roof was now scarcely a half dozen yards above. With fingers that fumbled in haste at tiny levers and dials, he spun several of them, the repulsion ray full, the attraction ray full, and when they were set, he picked up the bar he had dropped and smashed the controls so that they were helplessly jammed. He could almost feel the planet catapult through the heavens. The laboratory roof was only a foot over his head. He whirled around, squashed a dozen tiny creeping things, leaped to a disk that was now not more than a few inches broad. Stooping low, balancing himself precariously, he somehow managed to close the tiny switch. A haze of orange light enveloped him. There came a great vertigo and dizziness and pain. He felt himself falling through bottomless spaces. So exhausted that he could scarcely move, Phobar blinked his eyes open to brilliant daylight in the chill of a November Indian summer noon. The sun shone radiant in the heavens. Off in the distance he heard a pandemonium of bells and whistles. Wearily he noticed that there were no flame paths in the sky. Staggering weakly he made his way to the observatory, mounted the steps with tired limbs, and wobbled to the eyepiece of his telescope which he had left focused on the dark star two hours before. Almost trembling, he peered through it. The dark star was gone. Somewhere far out in the abysses of the universe, a runaway world plunged headlong at ever-mounting speed to uncharted regions under its double acceleration of attraction and repulsion. A sigh of contentment came from his lips as he sank into a heavy and profound sleep. Later he would learn of the readjustments in the solar system and of the colder climate that came to Earth, and of the vast changes permanently made by the invading planet, and a blazing new star discovered in Orion that might signify the birth of a sun or the death of a metallic dark world. But these were events to be, and he demanded his immediate reward of a day's dreamless slumber. End of Raiders of the Universes by Donald Wondry This story read by Phil Chenevere